The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity featuring Bruce R. Korf, MD, PhD, from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Michael J. Fisher, MD, from the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine, and Roger J. Packer, MD, from the George Washington University Medical Center. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash QAD860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thank you for listening to Peerview Podcasts. We greatly appreciate your support and would like to hear from you. Can we ask for a favor? Participate today in a short one-minute survey at www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to share how podcasts play a role in your medical education routine. Again, that's www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to participate. And now on to today's podcast. Welcome to this presentation targeting the RAS MAP kinase pathway in neurofibromatosis type 1 and plexiform neurofibromas. We have three faculty today. I am the Associate Dean for Genomic Medicine at the UAB School of Medicine and Chief Genomics Officer of UAB Medicine. Dr. Michael Fisher is the Chief of the Neuro-Oncology Section and Director of the Neurofibromatosis Program the Hubert J. P. and Ann Faulkner Shoemaker Endowed Chair in Pediatric Neuro-Oncology, Center for Childhood Cancer Research and Division of Oncology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He's a professor of pediatrics at University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine in Philadelphia. And Dr. Roger J. Packer is Senior Vice President at the Center for Neuroscience and Behavioral Medicine Endowed Distinguished Professor and Director of the Gilbert Family Neurofibromatosis Institute, Director of the Brain Tumor Institute, Children's National Hospital, Professor of Neurology and Pediatrics at the George Washington University Medical Center in Washington, D.C. There are three parts to tonight's agenda. First, I'll be speaking about the etiology, diagnosis, and clinical presentation of NF1 and NF1-associated tumors. You'll then be hearing about currently approved and emerging therapies targeting NF1 and NF1-associated tumors. And then we'll present two cases um, providing expert perspectives on managing NF1 in children and adolescents. I'm going to begin with an introduction to neurofibromatosis type 1. NF1 is associated with pathogenic variants in a gene mapped to chromosome 17 it's a large gene, 350,000 um, base pairs, not by any means the largest, but um, quite a large gene. The protein product is the protein called neurofibromin, which functions as a tumor suppressor and a negative regulator of the oncogene RAS. It is possible to arrange for clinical genetic testing, and there are some, albeit limited, genotype-phenotype correlations, and I'll cover those a little bit later on. NF1 is a clinical diagnosis, and diagnostic criteria were established now many years ago and have more or less stood the test of time. Most commonly in children, the presenting sign are multiple cafe au lait macules defined as at least six measuring five millimeters before puberty or 15 millimeters after puberty. The occurrence of skin fold freckling, especially in the inguinal or axillary regions, Neurofibromas consisting of at least two neurofibromas on the skin or one plexiform neurofibroma, which I'll define in a few moments. Iris Lisch nodules, at least two, and you'll see those shortly as well. The occurrence of optic glioma, a characteristic skeletal dysplasia, particularly tibial or long bone or orbital. And finally, an affected first degree relative, particularly apparent requires that at least two criteria be fulfilled in order to establish the diagnosis of NF1. And studies have shown that about 70% of individuals who are ultimately diagnosed achieve that diagnosis by about age one year and 95% by age eight years. Well, here are the primary pigmentary signs. On the left, cafe au lait spots, flat brown macules, 
generally with sharp margins that can vary in size from um, five millimeters or so um, to even several centimeters. And then on the right, you can see skinfold freckling in this instance in the axilla and also at the base of the neck. These also are commonly seen in the inguinal regions um, or under the breasts in women, anywhere where there's a skin fold. And the skin fold freckles usually become apparent between about three and five years of age. The defining feature of NF1 is the occurrence of the neurofibroma, and the most obvious place where they occur is on the skin. On the right, you can see a photograph of an adult with NF1 with innumerable cutaneous neurofibromas. Some become fairly large and pedunculated. Others are smaller, um, can even be millimeter size. Sometimes, as shown in the upper left, they can occur as um, essentially growths that are in the kind of um, surface of the skin and cause this violaceous kind of hue in the surrounding skin. And in the lower left, you can see an example where side lighting can reveal the occurrence of cutaneous neurofibromas, even in a fairly young child, although cutaneous neurofibromas usually don't become that obvious until around puberty. An increase in number and size um, during puberty and also in women during pregnancy. Now, plexiform neurofibromas um, can be quite disfiguring and cause um, some of the major morbidity associated with NF1. You can see in the upper left a child with a large plexiform neurofibroma involving the neck and the upper chest. And you'll notice also the cutaneous hyperpigmentation that often overlies the occurrence of a plexiform neurofibroma. In the MRI image to the right of that, you can see multiple cervical nerve roots that are expanded and then also a mass extending into the mediastinum on both sides. To the right of that, an example of um, disfigurement and overgrowth of the upper arm. And you may notice also the skin has a kind of roughened, almost orange peel-like texture uh, with hyperpigmentation. And then also very irregularly marginated hyperpigmentation in the upper shoulder. To the right of that, an MRI that shows the classic target sign associated with plexiform neurofibromas. To the lower left, you notice the entire course of the sciatic nerve is identified uh, by the hyperpigmentation and vascular markings, along with overgrowth of the foot in this child. And finally, to the lower right, overgrowth of the upper eyelid associated with orbital plexiform neurofibroma. Among the ocular manifestations, iris lish nodules consist of melanocytic hamartomas that are reliably present between probably about six and 10 years of age, um, more or less, um, require the slit lamp in order to be visible. So one can't rely on an ophthalmologic exam because Lish nodules are three-dimensional objects and need to be distinguished from iris nevi, which are not indicative of NF1. These are harmless uh, but good markers, diagnostic markers, of the possibility of an NF diagnosis. In the middle, you can see expansion of the orbital component of both optic nerves, um, consisting, constituting rather an optic glioma. And then to the right, you can see expansion of the um, optic chiasm. Um, you can see the optic chiasm is expanded. Characteristic skeletal dysplasia includes bowing of long bones. You can see in the upper left bowing of both the tibia and the fibula. And then to the right, this is the same child. You can see clinically um, the bowing of the lower leg. If this is going to occur, it usually will be visible in the first um, year to two years of life. Although not a diagnostic criterion, the occurrence of scoliosis is a characteristic feature of NF1. And these um, CT images, you can see the very sharp angulation of the spine on the left and on the right. Sometimes there will be a nearby plexiform neurofibroma, but often not. Um, and this can be quite um, disfiguring and require surgical correction. A list of some other complications includes short stature. Children with NF1 are often shorter than other members of the family. Macrocephaly, as you can see, is common. And in fact, oftentimes 
if the head size is normal, it's still disproportionate to overall stature. So you may see a normal sized head on a child who is um, quite short. Um, as best we can tell, the macrocephaly is not associated with neurologic manifestations such as learning problems or structural brain abnormalities. As mentioned before, scoliosis is relatively common. Um, a small proportion will require surgery, and sometimes there'll be a, a paraspinal plexiform neurofibroma, but not invariably. There is an increased frequency of seizures in individuals with NF1, as you can see. It would certainly constitute an indication for neuroimaging, although oftentimes you don't see structural lesions to correlate with the seizures. And headaches are very common in individuals with NF1, would constitute an indication for imaging if the headaches are either associated with other neurologic signs or are not controlled um, by medications. Among the vascular complications of NF1 include cardiovascular problems, um, including pulmonic stenosis and coarctation of the aorta can actually be narrowing of, of other major arteries as well. Hypertension can occur in a proportion because of renal artery stenosis, and this can happen in children and account for pediatric hypertension. Pheochromocytoma can be associated with NF1, not common, but important to recognize. And actually, the most common cause of hypertension in NF1 is essential hypertension. There can be a cerebral vasculopathy, which um, is associated with stenoses of major cerebral vessels, and a subset can actually present with Moya Moya syndrome and uh, may be at risk of stroke. Neurocognitive problems are very common in individuals with NF1, at least 30 to 65 percent. A proportion have um, IQs less than 70. The histogram you see is an IQ curve. The blue bars were measurements by um, Catherine North in a study she did now many years ago, where she found a bimodal distribution of IQ scores. There was a peak at 100, but you see also a peak shifted to the left. The yellow bars um, I superimposed from a set of individuals with large um, whole gene deletions of NF1 who tend to have um, the most significant intellectual disability, um, and actually also an increased risk of seizures. Uh, there can be various kinds of other cognitive problems, visual spatial problems, uh, executive dysfunction, reduced cognitive flexibility, problems with maintaining attention, working memory, inhibition and planning, tension deficit disorder and hyperactivity are common in individuals with NF1, and a high proportion of school-aged children um, are underachieving. MRI will often reveal areas of increased T2 signal intensity in places like the basal ganglia um, and also the cerebellum. You can see examples of that uh, at the far right. These are not space occupying. They do not enhance with contrast. They're very common in children with NF1. They tend to fade over a period of years um, into late adolescence and into adulthood. Social dysfunction is also common Compared with peers and unaffected SIBs, uh, children with NF1 are more likely to be socially isolated, to be subject to rejection and teasing. Um, studies have shown that they tend to be less well-liked by peers, have fewer reciprocated friendships, higher levels of loneliness. And there are data suggesting a significantly increased risk of autism spectrum disorder um, and symptomatology associated with that. Studies have shown upwards of a quarter of youth actually may have some degree of autism spectrum disorder leading to a diagnosis. Given all the many manifestations, surveillance for complications, particularly treatable ones, is important. Generally, it's recommended that children with NF1 be seen at least yearly in a clinic familiar with the condition. Some of the specific areas to be monitoring include um, looking for optic pathway glioma. There remains some debate in the field as to the utility of routine MRI screening versus ophthalmology. Ophthalmology, though, is recommended at least yearly until about eight years of age, and then every other year until about 18 years of age. Plexiform neurofibromas are monitored by history and physical exam and by MRI if clinically indicated. 
malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, about which you'll hear more in a little while, um, is monitored, especially by history and um, physical. Um, families need to be alerted to taking seriously unexplained pain um, and, of course, growth of a lesion that previously was not growing or is growing out of proportion with others or changes in texture from soft to hard. Usually imaging is done, particularly M MRI, if clinically indicated. Um, fluoride deoxyglucose um, PET scanning can be helpful um, for lesions where a suspicion of malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor has occurred. And there's now the possibility of doing whole body MRI um, as a way of generally assessing tumor burden, though not at the moment um, considered um, routine care. It certainly is feasible to do and um, over the coming years is likely to be more frequently used, I would guess, um, as we have um, effective treatments that um, we can begin to institute about which uh, you'll hear more later. Clinical care guidelines um, so far mainly are cons consensus-based guidelines, mainly, mainly because the evidence base is limited for a relatively rare disorder. They tend to address things that should be watched for um, and when to watch for them how often individuals with NF1 need to be seen, what surveillance should be done, um, and increasingly what kinds of treatments are available. Over this past year or so, evidence-based guidelines have been published um, both for children and adults. This is a screenshot of a publication of evidence, uh, excuse me, of uh, consensus guidelines um, for uh, children with NF1 that uh, was put together by a joint panel of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. A few words about the genetics of NF1. It is a classic autosomal dominant disorder with complete penetrance but highly variable expression. So this means that any individual who carries a germline pathogenic variant for NF1 would be expected to show at least some of the signs and symptoms. And sometimes you'll see families like you see on the left, where NF1 has been transmitted from generation to generation, um, oftentimes for many generations. Um, either males or females can transmit to sons or daughters. But about half the time you'll see a family, as you see on the right, where a single affected child um, is, um, is identified and neither parent shows signs or symptoms of NF1. And this reflects a new genetic mutation. NF1 has a relatively high rate of new mutation. And if both parents are completely free of signs, uh, their risk of having other affected children is very low, barring the rare but not unheard of instances of germline or sometimes even somatic mosaicism. Uh, but generally speaking, um, sporadically affected children, uh, it is unusual to see affected siblings if both parents are free of signs, but the child will face a 50% risk of transmission to the next generation. And there are some individuals, by the way, who do have somatic mosaicism for NF1, sometimes evident by signs of NF1 being limited to a restricted body segment, so-called segmental NF, but sometimes just by a relative paucity of signs. Genetic testing for NF1 is possible. This is a slide provided to me by Dr. Ludwig Messian at UAB, um, who has um, really kind of spearheaded the effort to do genetic testing. Uh, the gray bar at the center is the NF1 gene itself. Every spot below it is a different pathogenic variant found in a different patient. Uh, the vertical lettering are splicing mutations, and then the horizontal bars are deletions. Um, Something in the range of 3,000 different distinct pathogenic variants have been identified over the years. Um, almost no two individuals will have the same one. Uh, the breakdown of mutations is shown at the top, about 5% are total gene deletions. The majority of the mutations are ultimately loss of function mutations, either nonsense or frame shift mutations, um, or sometimes um, splicing mutations. Uh, but a proportion of them are missense variants, that means amino acid substitutions. Mentioned briefly at the beginning that there are some, but limited, genotype-phenotype correlations in NF1. This is a list of 
those that have been published, um, a large deletion that deletes both the NF1 gene and uh, about 1.4 to 1.5 million base pairs, including multiple contiguous genes, produces a phenotype of a large burden of cutaneous neurofibromas, significant intellectual disability, dysmorphism, relatively tall stature, and an increased risk of malignancy. These are the individuals that I mentioned earlier who have an increased frequency of intellectual disability as well, and also seizures. A missense variant at codon 1809, which is an arginine, can lead to Noonan syndrome-like features, including pulmonic stenosis and short stature. A variety of mutations in codons 844 to 848 leads to a large number of plexiform neurofibromas, optic gliomas, spinal tumors, and malignancy of the spinal neurofibromas. An interesting mutation um, consisting of a three-base deletion that deletes a methionine at codon 992 produces a relatively benign disorder with lack of neurofibromas or gliomas, though um, pigmentary signs are present as is learning disability. Um, a set of mutations at codons 1149, 1276, or 1423 give Noonan-like features and then various others that are listed here. And there is a suggestion that mutations nearer the five prime end of the gene or in a specific domain called, um, it's a cysteine-rich domain, um, may be associated with an increased risk of autism spectrum disorder and glioma. Here's an example of an individual uh, with a large burden of cutaneous neurofibromas due to whole gene deletion. In this case, uh, fluorescence in C2 hybridization labeled the NF1 gene in green at one end and red at the other. At the bottom, you can see, first of all, a marker on chromosome 17, the bottom, but then you can see the superimposed green and red fluorescence representing the normal gene at the top that is missing, indicative of deletion. So when to perform germline testing? Well, a child who presents with multiple cafe LA spots, most probably uh, other signs will emerge in the next few years, but it's a way of achieving a diagnosis and avoiding the anxiety of, of wondering if NF1 is, is present. Um, so testing can be useful there. In a case of uncertain diagnosis, such as meeting only one clinical criterion, which would be the case in a child who presents with multiple cafe LA spots, or even who has multiple cafe LA spots, say in skinfold freckling, because there is another disorder called Legius syndrome associated with spread one mutation, which causes the pigmentary signs that are similar to NF1, but none of the tumors that are associated with the condition. Multiple spinal neurofibromas without other manifestations can be associated with some of the missense mutations I mentioned in the previous slide, and also sometimes with splicing mutations. An individual with um, severe kind of early onset, very large tumor burden, and um, both cutaneous and spinal tumors uh, may be suspect for a large deletion, and there is monitoring to be done there because of the risk of malignancy. Testing can also be useful for genetic counseling and, of course, for family planning. Okay, with that, I'm going to um, now turn uh, the presentation over to Dr. Fisher, um, who will begin the discussion of therapeutics. Thanks, Bruce. So um, before we talk about individual tumors, I thought it important to just cover the basics of NF1 tumorigenesis. So as Bruce mentioned, neurofibromin is a tumor suppressor gene. And so when you lose the second allele of NF1, um, you have lack or um, not enough neurofibromin in the cells. And neurofibromin functions to uh, accelerate the conversion of active GTP bound RAS to inactive GDP bound RAS. So when you're missing neurofibromin in your cells, you have increased signaling down RAS effector pathways, um, including the RAF MACMAP kinase pathway and the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway. Thus, you have increased cell proliferation and cell survival, and you can um, have tumor development. So I'm going to talk about uh, nerve sheath tumors. Uh, uh, Dr. Korf did a nice overview of the different kinds of nerve sheath tumors. Um, we're not going to be talking about the dermal ones, which are the small ones on or just under the skin, but don't have malignant potential. 
Um, I'm going to more focus on these larger nerve sheath tumors that um, uh, span from the benign nerve sheath tumor or the plexiform neurofibroma to the malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, which is a frank cancer. The hallmark of the molecularly of the plexiform neurofibroma is loss of the second allele of NF1. So they usually don't have additional mutations. Recently, um, we've identified this um, type of neurofibroma called an atypical neurofibroma, which is not only has lost both alleles of NF1, but has acquired a CDK N2A mutation. And often these neurofibromas are more nodular in appearing. You can see that on the MRI image. And then with um, acquiring additional mutations like PRC2 complex genes and TP53 genes, um, you can develop a frank malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. So plexiform neurofibromas, as I mentioned, are the benign version of the nerve sheath tumor. They can occur in upwards of 40 or actually 50% of patients with NF1. They can occur anywhere where there's a nerve or a nerve branch in the body, which means they can occur anywhere in the body. And while the tumorigenic cell, i.e. the NF1 minus minus cell is, the, is a Schwann cell, um, these tumors really require a heterozygous NF1 plus minus microenvironment to form. And so these tumors tend to be uh, composed of multiple cell types, including uh, fibroblasts, mast cells, perineural cells, as well as um, collagen and extracellular matrix. Now, most of these tumors are thought to be congenital, uh, but they may not be apparent in infancy. Uh, the indivi an individual plexiform's growth pattern is unpredictable, and, so, and within a person, um, some may grow, some may not grow. Fortunately, most of them are not growing or are growing slowly, but when you look at a collection of plexiforms that are growing, the fastest growth rates are early in childhood, and most tumors that are growing stop growing on their own by the end of the teen years or into early adulthood. The most feared complication is the transformation to a true malignancy, but you don't need to have malignancy to have severe complications from your neurofibroma. So if you look um, uh, at any of these tumors that I pictured here, the tumors may cause pain, both local pain and neuropathic pain. If you look at the upper left, you see a tumor that fills the arm, and you can imagine how that tumor may um, cause weakness from compression of nerves. If you look at the top right, uh, you can see that large facial tumor, which causes significant disfigurement. And then these tumors can be life-threatening when they compress vital structures, such as the trachea, as pictured in the MRI scan uh, on the bottom. So um, for a long time, the only um, effective therapy was surgical resection. And you can imagine by the pictures on the prior slide how challenging it would be to be able to take those tumors out. On top of that, the tumors are invested within the nerve, so there's a risk of um, further compromise of function if you take it out. And in fact, studies suggest that only about 15% of tumors um, that go to the OR can be completely resected. Uh, radiation therapy has no known benefit and is associated with an increased risk of second malignant neoplasm in this tumor predisposition syndrome. And up until recently, there have been um, no approved medical therapies. Chemotherapies have not shown to be effective, um, and most molecularly target agents um, are experimental. Now, the last two decades have, has seen um, a wealth of clinical trials for progressive plexiforms. And I'm just going to highlight four that I think um, are significant and sort of uh, set the stage uh, for the more um, promising uh, drugs that I'll mention uh, after this slide. So one of the early trials, uh, which was run out of the NCI, uh, was a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial of tipifarnib. And while tipifarnib didn't result in responses or an increase in time to progression, this gave us a, a placebo arm, basically a control arm, a, a natural history arm, so to speak, of patients who had growing tumors that were not getting treatment. And we were able to use this 
uh, in a NF clinical trials consortium study of the mTOR inhibitor serolimus uh, to compare uh, time to progression. And so serolimus also did not result in any responses, but it did show a modest increase in time to progression. Pegylated interferon alpha actually um, until recently was the most promising as far as increasing time to progression, um, although there was very little in tumor shrinkage. And then imatinib has shown some tumor shrinkage, but a minor amount in some patients and some symptom improvement. More recently, uh, there are uh, drugs that have resulted in much better response rates. So one of these is cabozantinib. Um, this was the, this is a uh, slide shows the study design for an NF clinical trials consortium phase two trial of cabozantinib in adolescents and adults with plexiform neurofibromas. Cabozantinib is a multiple receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So it's got multiple targets, including Axel and METs um, uh, and others. Um, and these targets are microenvironment targets and angiogenesis targets, as well as some direct Schwann cell targets. In this phase two trial, um, what you'll see here in the waterfall plot is, a, is that eight out of 19 or 42% of these tumors had a response. So for those unfamiliar with waterfall plots, all of the bars going down are shrinking tumors. Any bar going up is a growing tumor. The mark of a partial response um, denoted by this red line is 20% decrease in volume um, uh, during treatment. And so what you'll see here is eight out of the 19 or 42% had a response. It was fairly well tolerated. And this was so exciting that once we had a recommended phase two dose in children, we opened up a second arm for children three to 15 years of age. Uh, that trial is still enrolling, but is almost close to enrollment, and hopefully we'll have response data for children soon. Now, the most exciting developments of recently have been using MEK inhibitors uh, for plexiforms. And so you'll see, once again, this cartoon shows you, uh, isolates that part of the RAS pathway that's focused on MAP kinase. And while we'd love to put NF1 back into cells, uh, we haven't figured out how to do that yet. Um, uh, and we'd love to target RAS, but multiple attempts uh, have not been successful. So that the concept here is to sort of choke off this abnormal signaling pathway further down the line, um, and specifically at this protein called MEK. So there's a there's a whole variety of MEK inhibitors from various companies uh, that are in various stages of study. Uh, the one that's gotten the most press and the one that was tested first in plexiforms was selumetinib, um, a phase one trial led out of the NCI um, uh, was run for children three to 18 years of age um, at three different dose levels. And um, the study defined the recommended phase two dose is 25 milligrams per meter squared on a twice daily basis. You'll note that this is 60% of the recommended adult dose for, for malignancies. And so um, uh, the children uh, tolerated a less high dose, um, but I'll point out here, there were responses at all dose levels and there was a 71% response rate. Now this is uh, basically a home run. If you know about clinical, uh, clinical development of drugs and clinical trials, the goal of a phase one study is to evaluate the side effects of the drugs and to define the optimal dose. And usually in a phase one study, you know, a 10% response rate uh, is a good one. So getting a 71% response rate in a tumor type that really hadn't had any drug with a huge response rate uh, was really exciting. And on the basis of that, the phase two study was designed as an FDA registration trial. And in discussions with the FDA, they said, look, none of your tumors are going away completely, right? So you've got partial responders and they said, that's great, but show us that that amount of tumor shrinkage results in improvement in function and quality of life of patients. And so every patient, in addition to following, their, following them with MRI, was followed with functional endpoints, 
and patient reported outcome measures. And this just gives you an example of that and how complicated uh, this is. So each patient had to have their own individualized set of functional endpoints. So you can see in this MRI a patient with a tumor that fills the neck, upper mediastinum, pressing on the trachea, and into the left arm. Because of that, they needed evaluations of airway function, including sleep studies and pulmonary function tests, evaluations of strength and range of motion of the upper extremities, and then pictures to monitor uh, the disfigurement. And all of these functional endpoints were defined a priori um, prior to enrollment. So this shows you that 50 uh, patients were enrolled over a one-year period. The median age of the patients was age 10, and you can see that they were very large tumors with a median volume almost of 500 milliliters, and the patients had one to five uh, number of morbidities each. This waterfall plot shows that the phase two study confirmed the excellent response rate in phase one. The partial response rate was 74%. The confirmed partial response rate, which means two scans in a row, was 68%. On the left here, you can see a swimmer's plot showing um, what happens with um, uh, the PRO measures of quality of life. And you can see that most patients had some degree of improvement in quality of life. Uh, many had improvement in function. This is just an example of one patient with a disfiguring tumor of his right neck. That within one year, you can see that the, um, that the architecture of the neck is normalizing. And so, very exciting. You got tumor shrinkage with improvement of in function, improvement of function. Um, but it's important to point out uh, what we've discovered thus far is it appears that selumetinib um, has to be given continuously to sustain a response for plexiforms. This is just an example of a patient whose tumor, uh, if you look at the gray line, was just growing consistently for about 10 years. Patients started selumetinib. You can see a decrease in tumor size on selumetinib, but the selumetinib then needed to be held for an asymptomatic drop in cardiac function tumors started to grow again. Fortunately, we were able to restart at a lower dose and the tumor shrank again. So on the strength of that data, the FDA approved selumetinib in April of this year. It is labeled for children ages two to 18 years of age with plexiforms that are inoperable and symptomatic. The dosing is listed there. Um, the drug must be taken um, on an empty stomach, and at least right now, the capsules must be swallowed whole. Now, there are other MEK inhibitors in various stages of um, development. So the NF Clinical Trials Consortium did a phase two trial of mirtametinib for adolescents and adults with plexiform neurofibromas. Uh, this study showed a 42% partial response rate. Um, so you might say, well, mirtametinib, is that as good as the 70% seen in selumetinib? It's hard to say. These studies weren't designed to be comparable. One was in adults, one was in children. Um, one had a phase one to define the optimal dose uh, before starting, one didn't. So it remains to be seen whether we're going to see true differences in the effectiveness of the various MEK inhibitors. And this is another NF Clinical Trials Consortium study of binametinib. Binametinib is, a, is another MEK inhibitor which has an advantage in that it can be put in solution, so very young children might be able to take it. Um, and this uh, study has two strata, both an adult and pediatric stratum, uh, that is completed enrollment um, and uh, uh, is too early to report on responses. So now it's very exciting. Now that we have emerging therapies, you know, you need to think thoughtfully about who should be recommended for treatment. Because I mentioned before, most of these tumors um, are not necessarily growing or causing problems. So how do you think about whom to treat? Well, think, ask yourself a few questions. So one, is the tumor growing, right? That's important. And or what's the age of the patient? Because if you meet a patient for the first time and they're 20, odds are that tumor is not growing. But if you meet a patient for the first time and perhaps they're two years old, well, then there's a reasonable chance that that tumor could be growing. And then 
the most important thing is, is there morbidity? Is there pain? Is there significant disfigurement? Is there a functional deficit? Or, especially if you have a growing tumor, is there impending morbidity? Is that tumor adjacent to or already compressing important structures, but not yet symptomatic? Um, but it's important to note that in most cases, if you have a stable tumor not causing morbidity, that that tumor should be observed as that tumor may never progress or cause symptoms. Now, if treatment's indicated, how do you decide between surgery and a medical treatment? So for surgery, you need to think, can, I, can this tumor be resected without significant morbidity, as well as what's involved in that? Is it a single surgery? Is, do you, does it require a multiple stage surgery, et cetera? Um, if you're thinking medical treatment or clinical trial, then you want to think about if there's specific contraindications about using a particular therapy um, and or the duration needed to get an effect. For example, if you have spinal cord compression from a plexiform um, associated with new neurological changes, um, medical therapies are probably not going to work quick enough and you probably need to think more about getting that patient um, to a surgeon. Ultimately, you really need a multidisciplinary team of neuro-oncologists, neurosurgeons, neurologists, et cetera, um, conferring with each other uh, to decide, one, is treatment necessary, and then what's the appropriate treatment. So before we move on, just to do some take-home points and summaries on plexiforms. So one, um, functional evaluations and MRI scans are really crucial to understand if treatment is needed and the optimal timing. Um, at present, for plexiforms, existing therapies are limited, but these new therapies, such as MEK inhibitors and cabozantinib, result in tumor shrinkage and may help decrease pain and improve function. Um, it's not clear that these uh, drugs will completely resolve plexiforms, um, and they seem to date really effective only if one is continuing to take the drug. And once again, selumetinib at present is the only drug currently approved for treating plexiforms. So I wanna shift for just a couple of minutes to talk about malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. These are very aggressive soft tissue sarcomas um, with very poor survival. The lifetime risk is eight to 13%. Um, but the most common um, incidence is in adults, and in fact, um, less than 3% of children will develop an MPNST. In patients with NF1, most of these arise by transformation of a pre-existing plexiform, and I mentioned already some of the additional um, mutations seen in the tumors. Who's at risk? Uh, Dr. Korf mentioned those with whole NF1 gene deletions um, have, very, uh, have a very severe phenotype of NF1 and are higher risk for MPNSTs. As I mentioned, um, older patients are more at risk. And not surprisingly, if you have a large burden of plexiform in your body, there is more tumor uh, that um, is at risk for acquiring additional mutations and transforming into an MPNST. And as I mentioned earlier, we believe that atypical neurofibromas or a transition stage between plexiforms and frank MPNSTs. When should you be concerned? Um, that's always a challenge because the symptoms of an MPNST can also be the symptoms of a plexiform neurofibroma. But um, you should think about whether there's an MPNST when a patient has new pain or a change in the pattern of their pain. Um, if a patient has new tumor growth, or once again, an accelerated growth of tumor beyond their prior um, pattern, and if they've got new neurological symptoms. How do you work them up? Well, we do MR imaging to see the tumor. The problem is it's not very good at distinguishing benign from malignant. Um, so very often if we're worried about malignancy, uh, we do, as Dr. Korf mentioned, these FDG PET scans. Um, and we know that malignancies are more likely to take up a higher degree of fluorodeoxyglucose than plexiforms. And so you can uh, use that um, as, a, uh, as a marker to decide when you need to be more concerned. Um, I, also, I also use it 
um, if you've got a heterogeneous, if you have heterogeneous uptake into a tumor, to ask the interventional radiologist or surgeon to target their biopsy at the area of highest FDG uptake, is that the as that's the area that's likely to be the most malignant. What about treatment? Um, unfortunately, there's no known therapies that we know of that prevent malignant transformation. Uh, when you have an MPNST, surgical resection with wide margins uh, has been shown um, to improve survival, but that's often only achieved with significant morbidity. Um, the role of radiation therapy uh, is not defined as of yet. It certainly improves local control, but doesn't have a clear effect on overall survival. It's often recommended for large MPNSTs, um, for patients who have had surgery who've got microscopic residual tumor, and um, sometimes even before surgery uh, to try uh, and improve surgical resection. Um, as, as we've mentioned before, because NF1 is a tumor predisposition syndrome, we're always concerned about using radiation because of the risk of a radiation-induced second malignancy, particularly if you're radiating, if that MPNST has grown in a bed of plexiform, and now what you're radiating is um, additional plexiform that could transform. The role of chemo is also not universally agreed upon. Uh, many use it in the neoadjuvant setting um, with the thought that if we can get some tumor shrinkage, then the tumor could be more easily resected or to treat micrometastatic disease up front before local control. Um, and then you can use it if you're getting, a, if it's showing a response, uh, then maybe those are agents that you might use after local control. Unfortunately, to date, results of trials with targeted therapies have been disappointed. Um, so disappointing that the clinical endpoint right now uh, for clinical trials for MPNST is what's known as the clinical benefit rate at four months. So stable disease or tumor shrinkage at four months. So a very low bar to look for an effective agent right now. The chemotherapy typically used um, uh, includes cycles of I-phosphamide, doxorubicin, and cycles of I-phosphamide and etoposide. Um, uh, that's based somewhat on this study from, uh, from the SARC, which is the sarcoma consortium, uh, that showed um, a reasonable number of responses, unfortunately, that did not translate into improved survival, but clearly um, can be active in uh, many tumors. Uh, targeted therapies are now being evaluated. There's a ongoing clinical trial um, from the NF Clinical Trials Consortium in collaboration with SARC, looking at the MEK inhibitor selumetinib and the mTOR inhibitor serolimus for MPNSTs. This is based upon uh, work in an MPNST uh, transgenic mouse model in Karen Chikowsky's lab that showed that this combination shrank uh, MPNSTs in those mice. Um, this study was set up with a two-stage design requiring the clinical benefit in one of the first seven patients to then expand enrollment. And I can report that this study recently expanded enrollment and will be enrolling up to 21 uh, patients. In addition, there is a trial in development um, uh, based upon work of Tomas Durate when he was in Dr. Chikowsky's lab. And this will be a phase one, two trial of the MEK inhibitor selumetinib plus a BRD41 inhibitor along with a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, once again, based upon work in the transgenic MPNST mouse, which showed that this combination uh, led to um, responses. So with that, um, I will um, stop and, and hand off to Dr. Packer uh, to talk about low-grade gliomas. Um, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Bruce. Um, great introduction to the whole problem. Um, NF-associated low-grade gliomas occur in about 20% of patients with NF. They're not all in the chiasm. They can occur in different parts of the nervous system, the two Predominant places they occur are in the visual pathway in young children and then potentially in the brainstem in older children. They are also potentially 
uh, those that may arise in different areas of the brain, especially as the patients get older. And as we talk about young adults with these tumors, it's a, probably a much different disease. In children, almost all of these tumors, if biopsied, are going to be found to be polycytic astrocytomas. That's not always the case in adolescents, especially young adulthood. Optic pathway tumors typically occur in young children. They rarely actually are progressive in children greater than four or five years of age. They can result in visual loss. And unfortunately, it's trying to determine who's going to get into trouble with these tumors and who isn't. The MRI changes don't always correlate to what happens in visual outcomes, although the larger, bulkier tumors more posteriorly usually are more of a problem. And assessment of progression or response to treatment can be really a very significant challenge, especially when they occur in very young children where it's very difficult to get adequate ophthalmologic assessments, assessments of not only acuity, but visual field. Although saying all of that for visual pathway tumors, the ophthalmologic examination is crucial. One of the major things to remember is that most NF1 low-grade gliomas, especially of the chiasm and visual pathway, do not need treatment. And separation of what areas are tumors and what areas are dysplastic areas or hamartomatous areas can be very difficult. We have a limited understanding when we first see a tumor, unless there's clear-cut history of acute visual loss or an, two MRIs, which tumors are going to require intervention. The identification of prognostic factors is crucial to minimizing the morbidity of these tumors, but we just don't have them. But we do, unlike the situation for plexiform neurofibromas in NF1, there are some standard therapies that are effective. So we have to take a look at any new therapy and compare it cl very closely to what standard therapy would do. And also low-grade gliomas occur in children without NF1 in the visual pathway. And although they may be as responsive to therapy, they have a more difficult natural history. And this identification of new potential targets for treatment, as has been talked about before, has been really a major transition for the care of these patients. The first de decisions that have to be made in children with low-grade gliomas, especially those of the visual pathway, are we treating a cancer or a chronic disease or both? NF lesions may progress, but may progress very slowly, or once they seem to be present, may not progress at all. Once we decide that we have to consider treating the child, the second question is what are the short and long-term consequences of treating the child or not treating the child? And one of the things that we see a lot and we get second opinions on is are we treating the child or the neuroimage? And this is a critical issue because very small lesions can double in size but still have no real significance clinically. And we've also always got to try to develop treatments to treat the child and not the neuroimage. There are ways to look at this in different graphic forms, looking at what the visual problems are with the child. There are ways that have been piloted by others, Rob Avery in Washington initially and then in Philadelphia, really try to objectify what would be enough visual loss that would be indicated for treatment but still, it's still a feel decision sometimes. And other times, it's really dependent on the age of the child of what you can really figure out. Clearly, when things are really falling apart visually or for brainstem tumors, when there's neurologic progression, the decision to treat can be a relatively easy one. Most of the cases fall in this consider to treat and knowing when to pull the trigger is as much a art form and sometimes just listening to the child and listening to the family as it is only looking at the images. And there's certainly a large component, up to 80%, that will not need treatment at all. What are the current treatments for NF1 low-grade gliomas? 
or especially in the visual pathway and frequently in the brainstem, surgery is not pursued because of the likelihood of further compromise. In a child who has a completely blind eye, has no vision with a lot of proptosis and no extension posteriorly of the tumor, possibly removing that tumor, uh, trying to have a globe-saving procedure, or actually using a prosthesis is indicated, but I can tell you in my clinical experience, we do that very infrequently. And sometimes the cosmetic outcome is not as good as might be hoped. Radiation therapy is a different factor. Radiation therapy does work with these tumors, but we are concerned of malignant transformation. Secondary malignant tumors, also just radiating the body of the whole leukemia or vasculopathy, as was mentioned by Dr. Korf. Circle of Willis is very close to these areas or could be involved in these areas. We worry about enhanced neurocognitive damage. And the risk of all of these things is poorly documented, but we think it is associated with radiation therapy. Also, some of the chemotherapies you might think for low-grade tumors don't particularly work that well in pediatric low-grade tumors, and also such as the alkylators have significant risks of mutagenesis. The standard treatment for NF1 low-grade gliomas, and this is an incrimination of the field, probably remains carboplatin and vincristin for the past 30 years or so. It's a standard treatment because it works, at least as, as regards controlling disease and at times causing shrinkage of the lesion, but it doesn't work nearly as well as regards improving vision. In one study that Dr. Fisher coordinated, an international study, about a third of patients improved who received the drug, maybe up to 30%, even though some clinical stabilization did not visually stabilize, and the majority of people really were stable. After chemo, these kind of chemotherapies, there's no specific drug that has been considered a second-line chemotherapy for patients with NF1, although there's increasing data considering the benefit of emblastin. There's also, which I'll show you, the potential use of bevacizumab, and now we're really moving into the molecular targeted therapies, which I think have been a major change in the field. When you take a look at many studies done over many years, prospective studies, the vast majority in children with NF have been done with carboplatin and vincristin. Carboplatin itself does not really have much mutagenic effect. Vincristin, although a nuisance drug causing neuropathies and sometimes pain and sensory problems, constipation, is relatively well tolerated. And if you take a look, Many prospective studies have been done, usually in younger children, but some older children have been given therapy. And the overall disease control rate, especially in the NF population, sits somewhere between 60 and 70 percent, three to four to as much as five years after initiation of treatment. That still says a significant number of children will progress. And we've already told, talked about that many of these children will not gain uh, visual improvement on treatment. The overall survival for this group of patients is really very good as long as you don't start messing with mutagenic therapies like radiation or high-dose alkylator treatments. One of the most interesting experiences that entered into the sort of more molecular-based area was the use of bevacizumab and arinotecan in low-grade gliomas. I think most of the information is really focused most, more on bevacizumab. We don't really know exactly what the benefit of the arinotecan was, but bevacizumab is a monoclonal antibody against e VEGFR, vascular endothelial growth factor, and it was used widely in adults with high-grade gliomas. And then our group actually was the first to use it in pediatric low-grade gliomas, including NF1 low-grade gliomas, because we were desperate. We had a group of children who were failing, even though we knew there was a risk of bleeding, and there was some limitations for the use of the drug.
the learning curve on this was as, as in this child. Not only could we see that a significant number of patients benefited from the bevacizumab therapy in the first 10 children we treated, seven benefited with tumor shrinkage, but we saw these remarkable improvements in visual acuity, as in this child who started therapy with a dense field cut, that's the left-hand side, and by, the, by a few months of treatment, the child who had long-standing visual loss not only had that radiographic response that could be seen on both the enhanced and non-enhanced tumor, but also had a remarkable improvement in visual acuity. The difficulty with bevacizumab as a side effect profile and the other difficulty is that often when you stop the drug, the tumor would come back and most of the clinical improvement would disappear. There is a randomized perspective study being done internationally comparing vinblastin to vinblastin and bevacizumab for newly diagnosed patients with progressive low-grade gliomas, including those with NF. One of the major important parts of this study is that unlike many of the other studies that only looked at progression-free survival, this study actually is also looking at a co-independent primary outcome measure of visual or neurologic improvement. And I think that's where the money is with treatment of NF-associated low-grade gliomas. Another molecularly targeted drug that has been used has been Everlimus or RAD001, which is an mTOR inhibitor. There are some animal models suggesting that the mTOR, path, but mTOR pathway or the effector of mTOR is actually something that's a, a real target for NF1-associated low-grade gliomas. That has not been found in all models. In a l fairly large study, initially done, which included some children with NF, you could see that the response rate was not as dramatic, about 4 out of 24, 25 patients. This one, 23, were valuable, had a partial response, but you did see a fairly large number of patients with stable disease. There has recently been completed through the Department of Defense NF Clinical Trials Consortium a phase two study using Everlimus for recurrent radiographic progressive NF1 low-grade gliomas. And once again, the overall response rate in this group of patients was not high. Three patients did have a response. Most had stable diseases, but you can see that some of that stable disease in the survival curves to the right, this is progression-free survival, about 40 to 50% of patients seem to benefit from this treatment, and, per, and even after one year of treatment, could hold their response for very long periods of time. So it is something that is in the potential armamentarium for treatment of NF1-associated low-grade gliomas. But really, the breakthrough both in children with NF and without NF is the understanding that the RAS MAP kinase pathway is activated in the vast majority of children with low-grade gliomas, in non-NF, this is due to some kind of mutation of the BRAF gene, either a duplication or a point mutation, getting aberrant signaling in the RASMAP kinase pathway, as uh, Dr. Fisher and Dr. Korf uh, gave us information already, the loss of NF1 activates that pathway. And the pathway, especially in non-NF1 patients, can be mutated at a variety of different areas, but all causing this RAS MAP kinase aberrant increased signaling, and also giving us, for, for the first time in pediatric neuro-oncology, a single pathway disease that we could potentially target and treat, whether it's patients with NF1 or non-NF1. And this would be somewhere in the non-NF1 in 70 to 80% of patients and maybe even higher. So uh, Dr. Fisher showed you a waterfall plot of what we saw in plexiform neurofibromas. This is what we saw in a waterfall plot of children mixed with low-grade gliomas, both with and without NF. And you could see that about 70% of patients had some degree of shrinkage, 
the NF patients were predominantly in that brown box area. Many of them responded well. And then that led to a very quick phase two trial using MEK inhibitors in NF1 low grade gliomas. And this has recently been published. I'm showing you two strata. Strata one are patients without NF1 and low grade gliomas, the far right hand graph, and the waterfall plot on the children with NF1 is that middle uh, picture. And you can see almost everyone with NF1 had some degree of response. One major thing to point out is the bar for low-grade gliomas is significantly higher than that of plexiform neurofibromas. We consider a partial response a greater than 50% reduction in the non-enhanced image, the T2-weighted image, or flare image, not the 20% for plexiform neurofibromas. And that's predominantly because we, unlike plexiform neurofibromas, we have active disease. We have, I'm sorry, we have active therapies that can treat active disease, chemotherapy. And we can see the overall response rate is a fairly good one. And sometimes these responses are dramatic, as in this child with baseline and post-treatment. One thing to just know about this, it can take up to six to nine months to see radiographic response. But in this child, you can see how much shrinkage there was. And this is a near complete response. This has led to a international randomized trial now open in the United States and Canada, comparing carboplatin and vincristin versus sulametinib in newly diagnosed children with untreated progressive NF1 low-grade gliomas. Dr. Fisher is one of the study co-chairs of that study. And we're looking to see if carboplatin and vincristin and sulametin have compared in their responses and to determine which one of either will give us better functional outcome, including visual and neurologic functional outcome. One of the things to take a look at with all of our MEC trials, especially for those of you who are used to chemotherapy and the side effects, the MEC inhibitors have a different side effect profile than do standard chemotherapies. We don't usually see decreased blood counts. We don't usually see hair loss. We see different things. We see a rash, which can be very severe in older patients, especially, especially um, pubertal patients. We see problems with the nail beds. We see weight gains, especially in females. And one of the things is a very interesting one that you often see CPK elevations, but usually that's not associated with any neurologic problems. But there's a subgroup of children, especially young ones, where hypotonia and muscle weakness is a significant problem. One of the major initial risks that we were concerned about was retinal damage. And that's because there was venous occlusions noted in adults at different doses of the MEK inhibitors. We have not seen that problem significantly in the pediatric patients, but we still have to be on the outlook for that. And one of the other questions that was raised, what about developmental issues? Because these are affecting critical pathways. And the answer is to date, we have not seen any significant developmental damage. And actually studies being done at, in Children's National and NIH have suggested the potential of possible improvement in overall neurocognitive functions in NF1 patients while on treatment. So what are the current status of MEK inhibitor therapies for NF1 tumors? Uh, just mirroring the uh, data and information that Dr. Fisher gave you, there's multiple different drugs, each having somewhat different qualities. None have yet been approved for that indication. Sulametinib, that was the data I showed you. There's a smaller, but a, but a phase two trial completed on trametinib. Mirdermetinib has been tested, but not in as many patients. Bimimetinib is nearing completion of a phase two trial, and cobimetinib is still being looked at. And dependent on the age of the patient, the preparations, sulametinib does not come in a liquid form. Bimimetinib easily goes into solution. There may be reasons to use one drug over another. So there are remaining questions with the MEK inhibitors. 
What are the effects of the MEK inhibitors on functional outcome? So far, we haven't seen any significant problems, but the studies are still young. Combination therapies, are they going to be necessary? One of the things that was brought up in the plexiforms by Dr. Fisher is that all the patients that seem to be on the MEK inhibitors with the plexiforms frequently fail and have the tumor progress if they were growing before they started the um, therapies when they come off of therapy. That has not been the experience yet with the pediatric and F1-associated treatments with MEK inhibitors. Actually, most of the patients have maintained their response when they came off of therapy, although, again, our follow-up is only a couple of years. But we also have this effect of senescence in, in low-grade gliomas in children, especially of the chiasm. We sort of expect that they're going to turn off. How do the MEK inhibitors affect senescence? Will they delay it? Will they not allow it to go into its normal senescence phase? Those are the things that we really need to know, and we wish we had biomarkers to give us better understandings. One of the last things I want to mention with NF1 is NF1 and low-grade gliomas, especially in older patients, children past puberty, those going into young adulthood, may be a significantly different disease, not because they do not have aberrant RASMAP kinase signaling, but because, as in this uh, study, a significant number, as they get older, will pick up more mutations and actually have their tumors evolve into something called an anaplastic pyeloid tumor. Uh, at mutations including CDKN2A and ATRX, not that dissimilar as, as plexiforms get to be higher-grade tumors, can happen in patients with NF1 and low-grade tumors that are older, and that's why we believe that the older patient really should be a candidate for biopsy before any initiation of treatment, or a younger patient that transforms their tumor, at least on MRI, in an unexpected fashion. We do not believe that all patients with NF1 and low-grade tumors need to be biopsied. So what are our summaries for NF1 and the transformed low-grade tumors? One of the other things we're learning is that standard chemotherapy, even, even if, if tolerated, is not particularly effective. MEK alone preliminarily tends not to be beneficial in the long term. Treatment with bevacizumab is not proven, and we believe that really combination therapy is going to be a major tenant of this therapy, probably with the MEK drugs. Take-home points on NF1-associated low-grade gliomas. As we started off, we have to decide who needs treatment and what the goals of treatment should be. Chemotherapy, unlike the situation in plexiform, neurofibromas, and NF1, is an effective treatment option, but visual Im improvement that is significant is not particularly frequent. Molecular therapies are excellent alternatives for treatment for NF1-associated low-grade gliomas, but the real caveat is that short-term toxicities are different from chemotherapy. You need a team that understands that to, uh, to treat the patient. And for those who are chemotherapy-oriented people, it's going to be a different ball game. And for those uh, who are take care of NF, such as geneticists and neurologists who don't use a lot of chemotherapy, it's going to be another type of learning curve in how to use these drugs. And we also don't know the long-term sequelae. They're unknown. One of your biggest aids is going to be your nurse practitioner or your nurse helping managing these patients who are on MEK inhibitors. But the unprecedented activity of these MEK inhibitors in clinical trials for both plexiforms, as um, Michael has shown in low-grade gliomas, is really changing the treatment landscape for these tumors. And then I'll turn that over back to Bruce. Thank you. Okay, Roger and Michael, thank you both. So now we're going to um, look at a couple of case studies um, and ask you both for some comments. All right, well, the first um, is an eight-year-old girl uh, with um, familial NF1 and a right uh, facial, orbital, and cervical plexiform neurofibroma. Uh, you can see the MRIs to the right. Um, 
She had had debulking of the right upper eyelid, um, ptosis correction at age two years, uh, debulking of the right face, forehead, and the palate and upper lip at age five years, and again debulking um, of a left cervical plexiform neurofibroma at age seven years. And the question really is, um, would you treat this patient? And um, let me ask Michael if um, you could make some comments, please. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so, you know, I get back to what I was talking about before. I asked myself two main questions. Uh, is the tumor growing and is, and is there morbidity? And so just from is the tumor progressive, uh, in this case, the answer was actually no. There was less than 20% increase in tumor size actually in the prior 18 months. Um, but the other question, uh, is there morbidity, was quite different. And there was quite a bit of morbidity. So the tumor, as you can see, invades the orbit on the right, and there was associated visual loss on the right. You can see how disfiguring that tumor is just from the MRI scans. Uh, the tumor also um, uh, invaded and compressed the auditory canal on the right, resulting in a hearing deficits. Um, if you look in the bottom right picture, you can see how the tumor um, invades the palate and the teeth, causing challenges with, with chewing. And um, in the neck, it was compressing the trachea. And in fact, this patient um, had had a tracheostomy placed uh, several years beforehand. So um, yes, we thought that there is um, definitely an indication to treat because of the morbidity. Then the question is, once you decide treatments needed, how, what treatment choice do you make? Um, I always think about surgery first, and I ask the question, can you get the tumor out without significant morbidity? And I think um, the audience can tell from those pictures that that was not going to be the case. And so in that case, we considered um, a clinical trial. Um, uh, actually, there was no approved medications when I first met this patient. And so I considered whether there were any specific contraindications for treatment, um, as well as how quickly I needed to get an effect. Um, and the reality in the end was that this patient uh, enrolled on a clinical trial of selumetinib um, and actually had um, a great response uh, with tumor shrinkage uh, and eventually able to uh, be decannulated from the tracheostomy. Um, but, you know, just a reminder, this required, once again, really the input of the multidisciplinary team um, in, in um, evaluating this patient. Great. Well, thank you. Let's go on to the second case. Uh, this is a one-year-old boy who was referred to a pediatric neuro-ophthalmologist for swelling of the right eyelid. An exam uh, was found uh, decreased vision in the right eye with an enlarged globe. And if one actually hadn't been previously appreciated, but at that point um, he was diagnosed based on also having multiple cafe LA spots, ax axillary freckling, and what was thought to be probably a plexiform neurofibroma. An initial MRI scan showed an enlarged left optic nerve and right orbital plexiform neurofibroma and um, possibly impairment of um, vision in the right eye. Um, here you can see um, baseline MRIs and um, then um, sequential MRIs um, over a period of, um, I guess, about six months. And the question here is, would you treat both the optic pathway glioma and the plexiform neurofibroma um, or continue with surveillance? And let me ask Roger if you would please comment here. Yeah, th this is part of the complexity we see that there's that very large swelling over the child's right eye. Yet people did not appreciate for probably the first six months of the child's life the cafe au lait spots and thought that the child had either cellulitis or some kind of hamartoma. No one wanted to biopsy it and sort of gave up on the vision in the right eye because the globe was so large. It was later when he was referred to the neuro-ophthalmologist and the abnormality was found on the left optic nerve that people started thinking about NF. But because often there's some nihilism or a real 
concerned that you don't want to treat these kids because there isn't much you can do. The family got the feeling that nothing needed to be done, that this child was just going to be like this the rest of their lives and didn't need to come back from treatment. So when the decision was made not to treat the child, there was another gap in getting the child back. And by that time, unfortunately, the left optic nerve, which was out of the better seeing eye, was getting worse, larger, and vision was falling in the left optic nerve, and there was no vision in the right eye. Now, one of the other complexities of this, and it's it's real, is that it's very hard to know what the vision is in a one- and two-year-old. And getting cooperation in a child, many of who have developmental challenges, can be very difficult. And ultimately, when vision falls far enough, people can make that determination. But early reductions in vision can be very difficult to determine. So this child was initially treated with chemotherapy. Unfortunately, had no response to the plexiform. As you could guess, because as Michael showed you, chemo did not have a high response rate to plexiforms stabilization, as we've shown you with carboplatin, to the left optic nerve, and therapy was stopped. And again, this child was followed and then neurologically worsened with both of the um, growth of the plexiform, and then the left optic nerve got even bigger, and people got very scared that he was going to lose the rest of his left optic nerve vision. And that now we were in the MEC era, and this child did receive selumetinib that had a really dramatic response. They all don't. Had shrinkage of the left optic nerve, would actually what we think is improved vision. Now the child's about four years of age, and you can tell. And the amazing thing, there was some vision left in the right eye as the plexiform started to shrink, but I don't know how useful that vision was. However, although the MEC therapy, which we have not talked about, for most optic nerve gliomas is considered to be a two-year period, this therapy was stopped after one year due to repeated bouts of weakness with CPK elevations in this fairly young child to where the child actually intermittently lost the ability to walk. And this gives us the issue, do you monitor for increased CPK? For most of the time, we'd like to ignore it unless there's clinical findings associated with it, but we want to just be sure we don't run into children who are hypotonic hypotonic with it. And the only way in children who are hypotonic to get over the hypotonia is to try to stop the medicine temporarily and often decrease the dose. And ultimately, after two uh, holes and three reductions in doses, this child had to come off of therapy. And that's part of the complexity of treating these children and why it really becomes a very multidisciplinary um, process, not only to look at the older children who get into trouble with the rashes and the paronychia, but also the younger children who can get into trouble with hypotonia and other potential developmental issues. Okay, thank you. Well, let me uh, just make um, a few closing comments. Um, it should be obvious at this point that um, we are in a an era of um, major change in the way we think about neurofibromatosis. I think when um, many of us started seeing NF patients um, you know, many, many years ago, uh, you could make a diagnosis, but um, the treatment options, especially for things like plexiform neurofibromas, were extremely limited. Um, huge progress has been made, um, but as you've heard, there's plenty more that needs to be done in order to achieve um, durable um, treatment of um, the plexiform neurofibromas over long periods of time, um, early detection of um, lignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. Um, there's, there's still work to be done um, in gliomas, um, all of the things you've heard about. If you think you know way into the future about um, where things are going, I, I like to think of um, three major areas um, where progress still can be made. One is what might be called smart surveillance. Can we learn to tailor surveillance to the individual? I pointed out earlier some instances of genotype-phenotype correlations, but they're few. Uh, But we still have a lot to learn about. um, Why is there such variable expression of NF1? And are there predictors, maybe other um, genomic predictors, for example, 
um, to help understand um, why one person develops a particular tumor and, and somebody else does it. I think in the long run, we hope that um, we'll be able to um, tailor the surveillance um, based on the individual to give just the right amount of surveillance um, and not more or not less. Um, does everybody always need um, visual um, assessment? Well, maybe the day will come and we'll be able to predict who's at risk of optic pathway tumors and, and who is not, for example. Uh, we are already in an era of targeted treatment. Um, MEK inhibitors particularly would um, exemplify this. I think um, there's plenty of work still to be done towards um, targeting um, both the, um, the RAS-MAP kinase pathway um, and um, things like um, intercellular signaling that seems to be important in the development of neurofibromas. Uh, so over time, um, in this era of precision medicine, we hope we'll be able to um, be more precise in terms of treatment. And finally, we are also in an era of community building, of um, individuals with NF1 um, communicating with one another, taking increasing sort of proactive responsibility for their care. Um, as these communities increase, the ability to obtain data of long-term outcomes and, and individuals' um, specific profiles of risk, I think will become greater and greater. And there's also a, a great need for increased access to care. Um, there are NF centers in uh, most of the kind of major cities, but lots of people live some distance away from NF centers and finding better ways to provide their care um, in a way that um, really provides access to a much higher proportion of the community, I think is another area uh, where there's a lot of work left to be done. So it's a time of, of huge hope uh, for individuals who um, live with neurofibromatosis and for those who provide their care. And um, I think we can expect um, lots of um, exciting developments in the coming years uh, to improve the quality of life of um, children and for that matter, also adults um, living with neurofibromatosis. And with that, um, let me um, now um, turn it over to um, a question and answer period. Then let me start with the first question on um, life expectancy. So there actually have been studies of life expectancy in individuals with NF1. Now, you know, they're limited because they're, they're based on um, studies of things like birth, uh, sorry, death certificates. Um, the evidence would suggest there is a um, overall reduction of life expectancy on average. Um, and the two most um, common causes of um, early mortality in NF1 appear to be uh, malignancy, especially malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, and vascular events. Um, there can be um, arterial stenoses and dissection leading to hemorrhage. Now, with this being said, it's important to realize that the range in terms of life expectancy is, is quite um, broad. And there are many people who live you know, well into um, standard old age um, with NF1. So there are lots of people who do survive a long time. But there definitely is a shift to the left, and a lot of it is accounted for um, by the two factors that I mentioned. Question is asked about the um, optimal method of imaging in an individual um, with a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor in terms of following that tumor. And Michael, perhaps you can address that. Sure. Um, so um, in a patient that I know has a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, uh, either during treatment or after treatment, we typically um, follow the local tumor. So the tumor we know that's an MPNST, usually about every three months while they're on treatment and about every three months in the first year following therapy and then extending out from there. We also um, like to follow closely for uh, high-risk metastatic sites um, like uh, the lungs. And so I'll often do a chest x-ray uh, at the same interval. And then, um, and then PET scans. And so I'll often use a PET scan during therapy. Um, for example, if I lead with chemotherapy, um, at the end of chemotherapy, not only will I re-image the tumor, but I'll often do a, a PET scan to see if there's any metastatic areas that have either developed or if there were metastatic areas 
Um, are they disappearing prior to local control? Once a patient's off therapy, I usually reserve that PET scan um, for um, approximately yearly intervals uh, to look for recurrence. Okay, we have a question um, asking whether um, MEK inhibitors um, are effective in the treatment of subependymal giant cell astrocytomas. Um, Roger, perhaps you can take that. Yeah, it's, that's very, it's a very interesting question in that probably the first tumor where we saw that molecular targeted therapy in pediatrics was going to be a benefit was giant cell astrocytomas, but that occurred in patients with tuberous sclerosis, a different type of neurogenetic disease than NF1. NF1 patients really are not at any higher risk of having giant cell astrocytomas, but in those patients with TS, the use of the mTOR inhibitors, initially serolimus and then more recently RADA01, has been remarkably successful in shrinking the tumors, although sometimes the tumors are almost addicted to the drug and it's difficult to stop the drug. That's not the kind of tumor that patients with NF1 have, which are predominantly pilocytic astrocytomas, with occasionally now we're seeing some mixed neuronal glial tumors that also may or may not be benefited by MEK therapy. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash QAD860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca.